Well, thank you for having us today. We'd like to thank Denise for setting this up and uh, Lakeland Community College for uh, welcoming us. Uh, the reason we're here is twofold today is October is National Disability Awareness Month. So it's always a good time to talk about disability awareness and sensitivity training. But Lakeland this year has opened a project search site. Project Search is a national, actually an international program uh, for high school students where they have academically graduated and they enter into a fifth year of high school where they work uh, in internships at a business or an institution where they learn job skills and get actual competitive experience with the goal to be that they will find community independent employment at the end of the year. So both Amanda and I are job placement specialists. So we work with the interns at the end of the year to help them find their competitive employment. So the interns will do three 10 week internships. We have two of the uh, job coaches that are kind of filling in that you might see around the campus. They're sitting up here in the front. Um, but at the end of the year, we help them find their jobs. Project Search is a really great national program. It's uh, evidence-based, so we work for United Cerebral Palsy, which we've recently changed our name, and you'll see it says Oakleaf Partners on all of our, our new material. One of the reasons it says Oakleaf now instead of United Cerebral Palsy is because when I walk in as a job placement specialist to a business and say I work for United Cerebral Palsy, it gives a business a very specific vision of the type of people that I work with. Whereas the reality is I work with everyone and we both work with everyone. We have people on our caseload that do have CP. We have people with cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities. And we employ, help people find employment everywhere from baggers at Giant Eagle to IT professionals to college professors. So we do a, we do a lot. Project Search, like I said, is a national program. Uh, Oakleaf has a 75% placement rate for Project Search interns. Uh, the national average, which we'll talk about a little later, of employment for people with disabilities is around 17%. So it's a lot farther and it's getting students and high school age students into their transition very early. So we've talked a little bit about Oakley Partners and our new name. Um, I'm gonna show you a quick video of what employment looks like. Because a lot of people, I think, go back to the idea of when you think of a person with a disability, what do they do? They think a lot of the bagger at your local grocery store are very simple jobs. And I think employment for people with disabilities has really changed in the last 10 years. And so we're gonna watch a couple videos and we're gonna try and keep this a little interactive. For people with disabilities, a job means so much more than a paycheck. A job means dignity, self-worth, independence. At Oakleaf Partners, we believe everyone should be given the opportunity to get a job that matches their abilities. Oakleaf Partners, an employment service of UCP of Greater Cleveland, helps people with disabilities find employers who will hire them to do productive, meaningful work in the community. We help people develop the skills they need to reach their full potential and secure a job. And we partner with employers who have needs that can match the skill levels of our clients. Our organization has more than 65 years of experience improving the lives of people with disabilities. We know how to prepare them for employment and how to help employers make the most of their talents. A job can be a path to freedom and independence. At Oakleaf Partners, we empower independence that works for you. So those are kind of a list of the different services and tools that we have. And uh, we'll have business cards and we'll be able to answer questions at the end. So let's get into this presentation a little bit. So we have a, a group of famous people. Um, does anybody know what these famous people all have in common? Anyone? They all have disabilities. We can go through, does anybody, uh, hopefully everybody knows everybody in the five pictures. But <laughs> does anybody know what uh, Abraham Lincoln, what his disability was? Uh, he had a mental health disorder with depression. 
he also, it was rumored and it was never found out that he had Marfan syndrome um, and possibly autism. Bruce Willis. Does anybody know? Bruce Willis uh, had a horrible stutter as a child and a speech impairment, and he was also dyslexic. Albert Einstein. He's autistic. I just heard it in the, in the back. Franklin Roosevelt. Pol polio. And then Stephen Hawking, I think, is probably the most famous, and he has ALS. But there's a lot of famous people that have disabilities. And one of the interesting things, when you look at these people, three out of the five have hidden disabilities. So disabilities that aren't in easily distinguishable. And even in FDR's case, they always say, if there was the multimedia that we have in today's age, FDR would have never been elected. He used to threaten the, the um, photographers in the White House to not take pictures of him in his wheelchair. And there are um, very few pictures of him as a president in a wheelchair. So why are we here? We're here to talk about working with people with disabilities. Has anybody worked with someone with a disability before? It's good, we're about half the room. So you guys have had experiences. And sometimes it's a little uncomfortable and you're not sure what to do. And so we're gonna talk about those things. The one thing is, there's no universal answer on how to work with someone for a disability. It's all to the person. Certain people have certain things. But the biggest thing is people with disabilities want to be treated just like everyone else. They don't want to be your special case. They just want to be part of the team. You want to go to the ground? Um, at first, it is OK to feel a little nervous or uncomfortable when meeting somebody with a disability. It really is OK. Um, the only thing you just have to think about is people first before disability. It's always there's a person there There's before the disability. Um, there's no stupid questions ever. And just relax, and you will get to know that person for who they are and not their disability. And um, you don't want to call somebody by their disability. You want to call them by their name. So today, we're going to go over some learning objectives. We're going to define disabilities. We're going to talk about communication and proper etiquette. We might get to the Employment First initiative. Um, employment First, I can give it to you in a nutshell. For a long time, people with disabilities, especially with uh, significant physical or cognitive disabilities, were put into workshops or day programs, and they were not ever offered employment. You actually had to prove yourself to see if you could get a job. The Employment First initiative is a nationwide initiative, and the idea behind it is people are offered employment first as an option. And then if that doesn't make sense for that person, then there are other options available. But they should always be offered employment. So you'll, you'll probably hear a lot about funding sources and and how it's changing, how like workshops and stuff are, are focused. But the idea is for people to work in a competitive, independent situation. Sometimes they have the help of a job coach. They may have the help of an aide. Um, so let's talk about learning objectives. We're in an increase in awareness of persons with disability and how society is rapidly, rapidly moving towards full inclusion of people with disabilities. I think the biggest example of this is our high school students. High schools were integrated probably 15 years ago uh, in streamlined for students with disabilities. So they've been, students with disabilities have been part of the high school atmosphere. And high school is a tough place to be a typical kid, let alone a person with disability. But I think high school students have really shown, and you, you see the inspirational videos on the internet constantly about more inclusion. The, the team manager that gets to play on the team, and it's just becoming a normal part of society, whereas instead of a, a segregated part of uh, the segment of society. Um, we're gonna talk about disability status. We're gonna talk about practical skills, how to deal with someone who's in a wheelchair, how to deal with someone with a visual impairment, how to deal with someone with a hearing impairment. Um, just some, some general guidelines that kind of help people. So we're going to define a de uh, disability. The, the definition, as you can see here, is uh, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of such individual. A record of the impairment 
and being regarded as having an impairment. Now, disabilities are, having a disability is the only minority that you could uh, be a part of at any time. So tomorrow you could be unfortunately struck by a bus and have a traumatic brain injury and you could join being the people with a group of people with disabilities. Whereas any other minority groups, you are or you are, it's very hard to, to join part of that group. Whereas a per, being a person with a disability is a group that you can join at any time. Um, you could have a stroke. There's a, there's a lot of ways you could lose your vision, you could lose your hearing. There's lots of different ways that you can become part of this group. So we're gonna sh watch another real quick video. This, uh, people may recognize this video. It aired during the Super Bowl a couple of years back, which Super Bowl commercials, everybody knows how expensive they are. Um, and they, they got some money together and it's just kind of a lighthearted uh, commercial, uh, commercial dealing with people with disabilities and how you frame them. Sure, I'd like to diversify my workforce. I just wish that all of the important information was gathered together in one place. Done. Thanks. Do you work here? Not yet. From tax info to debunking myths, the field guide to evolving your workforce has everything you need. Download it now at thinkbeyondthelabel.com. So it goes, to, it goes back to that thinking behind the label. I think when we, we think of a person with disability, we auto, automatically make a lot of assumptions about someone. And I think every person has their own strengths and weaknesses that we deal with as a society. And a person with a disability is no different. They're gonna have strengths and they're gonna have weaknesses. And that's how we, uh, we deal with them. So we'll talk about types of disabilities. There's visual impairments, uh, vision loss or low vision, but it can also be total blindness. And there, there's a varying degree and it. it affects people very differently. Um, both Amanda and I are finding right now, we both have uh, clients on our caseload right now that are totally blind. And there are very unique challenges. Uh, there are screen reading programs. Some people may have heard of it, it's called JAWS. Uh, JAWS is a great program. JAWS doesn't work with a whole lot of other software, especially in the corporate setting and custom developed software, JAWS has a hard time. So if you have total blindness, it, it's much harder than if you have low vision, there are screen magnifying software and a lot of different things. So we, even within the, the types of disabilities, there's a, a large array of how it affects different people. There's hearing impairments, hearing loss and total deafness. Um, speech impairments, often related to hearing. There could be stroke. There could also be cerebral palsy, ALS, different things that can cause speech impairments. Um, physical and mobility impairments, um, that would be just limitation to the function of limbs, um, the body itself, fine motor ability. There's also hidden disabilities, which we're seeing a lot right now, which is mental health, um, seizure disorder, developmental, you can have intellectual cognitive disabilities, um, autism spectrum disorder, which is very, very long type of, you know, spectrum. You can have somebody very high functioning with autism or somebody lower on the spectrum. And you also have learning disabilities. So when we talk about different types of disabilities, there are two types. Uh, we can kind of go into developmental and intellectual disabilities. And they're not one or the other. I kind of like to think about them as a Venn diagram because you can have a developmental intellectual disability, but you can have an intellectual disability and a developmental or a developmental disability as well. Does that make sense? I'm seeing kind of a couple. We'll give some examples here at the end. Um, so a developmental disability is a severe chronic disability that is characterized by all of the following attributed to a single or combination of mental or physical impairments other than one caused by mental illness. It manifests itself before the age of 22. 
Now, that number is different in every state. There is actually no federal guideline of what defines a uh, developmental disability. Each state has its own uh, legal number they come up with. Some states it's 18, some states it's 21, in Ohio it's 22. So you hear sometimes students will stay in a high school until 22 because that's when they're developmental disability and they're considered adults at 22. Uh, the disability is likely to continue indefinitely. It results in a developmental delay or substantial functioning. Persons usually has a combination of services and care plans that are planned and coordinated around the person's need. Uh, ISPs, which is an individual support plan, and IEP, an individual education plan. Uh, BSS, which is a behavior support plan, or I don't know what the yeah, se second S is. It's behavior support services, I think, and then an IPE. Um, and then on the intellectual side, it's specific limitations in intellectual functioning, reasoning, learning, problem solving, and in adaptive behavior, sometimes social and, pra uh, and practical skills. It could happen at any time. Um, I mentioned earlier traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injuries happen. I, uh, I've been around and have worked a lot. I've, I've worked with people with disabilities all my life. Uh, I actually have family with disabilities, so I kind of grew up in that, the culture of disabilities. But uh, in my first job, I also had a, uh, a house of gentlemen that lived together that all had traumatic brain injuries. So they weren't born with disabilities. They had had incidents in their life. Two of them had had industrial accidents, and one had had a car accident. And for them, it happened well into their adulthood Two of the gentlemen were married and ended up becoming, deciding to get divorced and moved into the house. Um, it caused some behavioral issues with them. Uh, there's a lot of symptoms of traumatic brain injuries, uh, but it can happen at any time. I lived next door to a young lady and she had, I didn't know, she had a, was in a car accident and we were at the mall and all of a sudden she just started swearing like a sailor. It could, be, it could be a symptom if she had had a, a traumatic brain injury. There's a, there can sometimes be, with traumatic brain injuries, uh, impulse control issues and, and stuff like that. Um, there's also, with traumatic and intellectual, there's a lot of concrete thinking. It, there's no gray area. It's black or white. Um, there doesn't have to be a known cause of a disability also, because there are a lot of genetic issues that we don't know about. There are certain things that do cause disabilities that we know about. Keep in mind, people with disabilities have varying levels of ability and may learn a little more slowly. That doesn't mean that they don't have the capacity to learn. It just means that we need to think about different ways in how people learn. As educators, I'm sure everybody's aware that people learn very differently. Some people are visual learners, some people are auditory learners, some people are experien experiential learners. Um, if you were going to stereotype, people with more intellectual disabilities are going to be much more experiential learners. That is not parse and parcel for everybody, but experience and having that experience of doing something and trying something first uh, is going to be a usually a better way for them lear to learn. Um, some people may have a hard time remembering newly obtained skills. They may have a hard time using what they have learned and implementing in a new situation. Um, so we have this happen quite often where we work with an individual, because after an individual gets a job through us, uh, they have access to job coaching. So a job coach may come in and help them for the first week or two, get acclimated to the job, augment some of the training that the employer is doing. Um, the job coach teaches to a specific situation where Bobby's going to unpack these boxes and put them on the shelves on the left side of the warehouse. Well, the warehouse changes the one night and Bobby now has to put the boxes on the right side of the warehouse. So he knows how to take the boxes off the truck, he knows how to scan them, he knows how to do the process, but the actual where they're going in the new location can sometimes throw people off. So they know the process, but the new situations can give them trouble. And we can adjust that through coaching um, and natural supports. One of the biggest things that we always advocate as an agency is natural supports. And that's the people 
that work with the individual. They're going to be there day in and day out. So being a support and treating them like everything, everyone else is really where you want to, to kind of start off at. This is important because this can really happen, like Andy said, to any of us at any second. Um, we also, the persons with the disabilities is the largest minority group, as Andy also stated. And um, we all learn in different ways. So what's important is that we are informed as people, coworkers, employees, neighbors, friends, or family members. You can also you can more effectively serve people with disabilities, and that's not right. <laughs> you can represent oh. a Lakeland in a responsible and ethical. Plagiarized myself, sorry. In a um, responsible and ethical manner. So let's talk a little bit about communication. We want to focus on the communication itself. You heard me mention a while back that sometimes people are a little more concrete thinkers. Uh, I used to work with a, a young lady and staff would come to me and say she, she's getting upset and we're having behaviors from her and what staff would do is she would ask a question can we go get ice cream tonight and staff didn't want to tell her no so they'd say we'll see or maybe well in her mind you didn't say no so it means yes so having very clear and concise communication with people and I don't always think that we're the best, people are the best communicators. Having very clear, concise statements of what you want and what your expectations are, um, are really what we need to focus on in the communication and how best to transmit it. Uh, I feel like I'm talking a lot, like I could do this a lot better if I was just giving you short statements of, of clarity to clarify what we want. The other thing is when you're communicating is to clarify with a person so they understand what you're talking about. I think we do this naturally with people. Um, short statements, do you know what I mean? You get that, right? Statements like that when I, when I ask questions or when people ask questions. To use people first language, focus on the person, not the disability. Can anybody give me an example? Or actually we're gonna, I think we have a list of, mm -hmm. yeah, we have a list of uh, people first languages, so we'll kind of go over that. And avoid group de uh, designations. The disabled, the handicapped. So a word that just drives me nuts. Probably almost more than the R word itself, and I won't even say it. Um, but those uh, words reflect individuality and equality and dignity. So you want to use words like that. But uh, an interesting thing about the word handicapped, does anybody know where that actually comes from, where the word handicapped comes from? So it comes from England and between the 17th and 17 and 1800s and people with disabilities uh, wouldn't have money so they would go out and have their cap out, cap in hand, and it became the handicapped and that's how they would beg for money and that is where that actual term comes from. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing and still people call it handicapped parking and Hopefully someday we'll change it to disabled parking. Negative language. Um, I'm sure we've, we all we talked about the R word. Um, we're trying to eliminate that. There's lots of campaigns out there to eliminate the word uh, retarded from popular language. Even here in Lake County, within the last 10 years, it used to be called MRDD or the Lake County Board of Mental Retardation, and now it's called the Lake County Board of Developmental Disabilities. So there's been a popular change in, in a, how we refer to people. Um, people aren't struggling with things or suffering or afflicted with a disability. They live with it. Uh, there's a video that we're going to see in a little bit that the woman, I could probably just play that, and she kind of sums everything up perfectly. Also, handicapped is a race for horses. Um, if you happen to have a disability, it doesn't make you normal, able-bodied. It makes you non-disabled. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people refer to typical and non-typical. Uh, that has come up. I've seen the, a lot of school districts have begun using that. Um, and then legislation like Rosa's Law to spread the word to end the word. And that has to do with the R word. Okay. Should I just go back and forth? Yeah. 
Okay. So we're just going to go through the negatives and the positives, how you should refer to somebody with a disability. So the negative, which it's hard to even say, but the retard or the retarded is a person with an intellectual disability. The blind, you should say a person who is visually impaired. The disabled should be a person with a disability. And do you see how the person's always in front of whatever you're saying that is the disability? The deaf, a person who is hearing impaired. A CP victim, a person with cerebral palsy. An epileptic is a person with cerebral or with epilepsy. Um, person confined to a wheelchair is a person who uses a wheelchair. A mute is a person who is a unable to speak. And a crazy person is a person with a psychiatric disability. So we're going to watch. This video is about nine minutes long, but I think it's really important. This is a, a TED Talk uh, that is just fantastic. And it's entitled, uh, I'm Not Your Inspiration. Thank you very much. I grew up in a very small country town in Victoria. Uh, I had a very normal, low-key kind of upbringing. Uh, you know, I went to school. I hung out with my friends. I fought with my younger sisters. It was all very normal. And when I was 15, a member of my local community approached my parents and wanted to nominate me for a Community Achievement Award. And my parents said, mm, that's really nice, but there's kind of one glaring problem with that. She hasn't actually achieved anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they were right, you know. I went to school, I got good marks, I had a very low-key after-school job in my mum's hairdressing salon, and I spent a lot of time watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Dawson's Creek. Yeah, I know, what a contradiction. <laughs> but they were right, you know, I wasn't doing anything that was out of the ordinary at all. Um, I wasn't doing anything that could be considered an achievement if you took disability out of the equation. Years later, I was on my second teaching round in a Melbourne high school and I was about 20 minutes into a year 11 legal studies class uh, when this boy put up his hand and said, hey miss, when are you going to start doing your speech? And I said, what speech? You know, I'd been talking to them about defamation law for a good 20 minutes. And uh, he said, you know, like your motivational speaking. You know, when people in wheelchairs come to school, they usually say like, <laughs> Inspirational stuff? <laughs> yeah. It's usually in the big hall. <laughs> and that's when it dawned on me. This kid had only ever experienced disabled people as objects of inspiration. We are not, you know, to this kid, and it's not his fault. I mean, that's true for many of us. You know, for lots of us, disabled people are not our teachers or our doctors or our manicurists. We're not real people. We are there to inspire. Um, and in fact, you know, I'm sitting on this stage, looking like I do, in this wheelchair, and you are probably kind of expecting me to inspire you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you dramatically. I am not here to inspire you. I'm here to tell you that we have been lied to about disability. Yeah, we've been sold the lie that disability is a bad thing. Capital B, capital T. It's a bad thing. And to live with disability makes you exceptional. It's not a bad thing. And it doesn't make you exceptional. And in the past few years, we've been able to propagate this lie even further via social media. You know, you may have seen images like this one. The only disability in life is a bad attitude. Mm. Or this one. Your excuse is invalid, indeed. Or this one. Before you quit, try. Yeah. Uh, these are just a couple of examples, but there are a lot of these images out there. You know, you might have seen the one, the little girl with no hands, 
drawing a picture with a pencil held in her mouth. Uh, you might have seen a child running on carbon fibre prosthetic legs. Um, and these images, you know, there are lots of them out there. They are what we call inspiration porn. <laughs> And I use the term porn deliberately because it, they objectify one group of people for the benefit of another group of people. So in this case, we're objectifying disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. The purpose of these images is to inspire you, to motivate you, so that we can look at them and think, well, however bad my life is, it could be worse. I could be that person. But what if you are that person? I've lost count of the number of times that I've been approached by strangers wanting to tell me that they think I'm brave or inspirational. And this was long before my work had any kind of public profile. They were just kind of congratulating me for managing to get up in the morning and remember my own name. <laughs> and it, it is objectifying. These images these images objectify disabled people for the benefit of non-disabled people. You know, they are there so that you can look at them and think that things aren't so bad for you, to put your worries into perspective. And life as a disabled person is actually somewhat difficult. We do overcome some things. But the things that we're overcoming are not the things that you think they are. They are not things to do with our bodies. Uh, I use the term disabled people quite deliberately because I subscribe to what's called the social model of disability, which tells us that we are more disabled by our bodies, by our, the society that we live in rather, than by our bodies and our diagnoses. So I have, uh, I've lived in this body a long time. I'm quite fond of it. It, it, uh, it does the things that I need it to do and I've learnt, I've learnt to use it to the best of its capacity, just as you have. And that's the thing about those kids in those pictures as well. They're not doing anything out of the ordinary. They are just using their bodies to the best of their capacity. So is it really fair to objectify them in the way that we do, to share those images? Uh, people mean, people, when they say, you know, you're an inspiration, they mean it as a compliment. They mean it as a compliment. And I know why it happens. It's because of the lie. It's because we've been sold this lie that disability makes you exceptional. And it honestly doesn't. And I know what you're thinking. You know, I'm up here bagging out inspiration. You're thinking, geez, Stella, aren't you inspired sometimes by some things? And the thing is, I am. I learn from other disabled people all the time. I'm learning not that I am luckier than them, though. I am learning that it's a genius idea to use a pair of barbecue tongs to pick up things that you drop. <laughs> I'm learning that nifty trick where you can charge your mobile phone battery from your chair battery. <laughs> genius. We are learning from each other strength and endurance, not against our bodies and our diagnoses, but against a world that exceptionalises and objectifies us. I really think that this lie that we've been sold about disability is the greatest injustice. Um, it, is, it, makes life, it makes life hard for us. Um, the, and that quote, the only disability in life is a bad attitude, the reason that that's bullshit <laughs> is because it's just not true. Because of the social model of disability, you know, no amount of smiling at a flight of stairs has ever made it turn into a rap. <laughs> Never. You know, smiling at a television screen isn't going to make closed captions appear for people who are deaf. You know, no amount of standing in the middle of a bookshop and radiating a positive attitude is going to turn all those books into braille. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Um, I really want to live in a world where disability is not the exception but the norm. I want to live in a world where a 15-year-old girl sitting in her bedroom watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer isn't referred to as achieving anything because she's doing it sitting down. I want to live in a world where we don't have such low expectations of disabled people 
that we are congratulated for getting out of bed and remembering our own names in the morning. I want to live in a world where we value genuine achievement for disabled people. And I want to live in a world where a kid in year 11 in a Melbourne high school is not one bit surprised that his new teacher is a wheelchair user. Disability doesn't make you exceptional, but questioning what you think you know about it does. Thank you. I love that talk. It's easily my favorite TED talk that I've seen in quite a long time, and she really nails everything that I've kind of always wanted to say in a, sh a short period. So we're going to move on to communicating with people with disabilities. And just some kind of tips for them. Uh, I think people, there are things that people do in faux pas that people make that they don't even often realize. The first one being when you're talking to a person with a disability, speak to them rather if they have an interpreter or a companion. Um, one of the Project Search interns this year has a personal care assistant that is with her on most days. And it's really, really easy to find yourself talking to the assistant than talking to the intern herself. Um, and actually, I just had a conversation with that intern today because she also has developed a bad habit of looking to her assistant to be to speak for her instead of speaking for herself. So it kind of goes both ways. So. We spent about 15 minutes after watching that video this morning with her uh, talking about being more of an advocate for herself. Um, when someone has a sign language interpreter as well, talk to the person, uh, not the interpreter. And that one's really hard for me because the hand movements just draw my eye to the interpreter every time. So it, that's a tougher one. Um, also, the easiest way to do that is stand next to the interpreter. So if I'm signing and Amanda's having a conversation with the audience, then I'm not, then Amanda's not tempted to look at the interpreter. She's talking to the person. And it's also a little bit easier for the person who's getting the information. Uh, when introduced to a person with disability, it's appropriate to shake hands. Uh, if people have artificial limbs, uh, if they have uh, a malformity of a hand, if they have CP, sometimes you'll see a, a hand that's turned down so people don't know what to do. Uh, we had a, an intern last year, he just reaches out and shakes hands upside down. He tries to make it as normal as possible for people. And don't make it weird, just ask, can I shake your hand or how do you like it? The biggest thing is just ask what people would like. Uh, when meeting a person who's visually impaired, verbally identify yourself and others who may be with you in the, in the conversing group. And uh, remember to identify the people that are speaking. Also remember to say goodbye. People tend to like, we back out of conversations a lot, especially if they're uncomfortable conversations and you're a group of people, you kind of slink away. If you're visually impaired, you don't know that somebody's gone. So it's really important to, to announce yourself when you come and when you go to a person. Um, if you offer assistance, wait until it's accepted. Just don't assume that some pe people want help. I was with a, a gentleman, uh, one of my clients that is totally blind, and I asked him the other day, do you want my elbow? And I also always ask him, what side do you want me on? Because depending on the person, they might want you on their left side, they might want you on the right. The standard is to be on the person's left. But each person is individual. But we kept getting to the doorways, and I'm a bigger guy, and he was a little bit of a bigger guy, and we could not get through the doorways. So finally, he, he told me, hey, when you get to the doorway, Go in first and then let me go through the door because I'm tired of getting stuck. Because two of us trying to fit through a doorway with a cane and an elbows out, it didn't work. So he told me what he wanted and we just made it work. What if you're passing uh, someone who's visually impaired in the hallway? Do you know them or are you just saying hi to them because you feel obligated to say hi? Actually, I would, if I'm, there's only two of us in a hallway passing each other, I, I would you know, look at that person and say hi. It, 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 it. Yeah, so you could just say hello so they know that they're not in the, in the hall. You might want to slow your pace up just so you're not hello and by them and they're trying to turn around. But you can announce it, especially if you know the person, stop and say hi. But if you don't know someone, you don't have to feel obligated to say hi to every blind person or disabled person that you meet. Just treat them like everybody else. 
I know it's kind of that. It, Exactly. Yes. I don't say hi to everybody, so I don't, like, unless I know you or I have to have a conversation with you, I don't say hi to people. And I'm the complete opposite. I would say hi to you regardless. So, non disabled or disabled, I would say hello. Treat adults as adults. That's, I think, something that, especially when you deal with someone with a cognitive disability, we baby people often. Um, also, never patronize people who use wheelchairs by patting them on the head or the shoulder. Don't lean on the wheelchair. Think of the wheelchair as an extension of somebody's body. I wouldn't talk to Amanda like this and lean on their wheelchair or do this. She'd probably go to HR. She's probably going to go to HR <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Why would you do it to a person in a wheelchair? Um, also, don't just assume that someone wants to be pushed if they are in a manual wheelchair or a motor wheelchair, motorized wheelchair. You may offer to get the door, but also offer and make sure that they want the help. Uh, Elizabeth today, and she is the intern that is in the motorized wheelchair, we were kind of talking about frustrations and different things like that, and she was lamenting that the it's not just here, it's everywhere. The timing on the doors, on uh, the automatic doors isn't always quick enough because she's a little slow on the trigger so she's like I keep getting hit in the back by the doors and she was at her dad's office the other day and she said it it knocked her good like knocked her off kilter and she got stuck in the doorway so you can ask hey would you like me to hit the button um, she had mentioned there was a place where there's a heater out in front of one so she has a hard time reaching the button and getting out of the way so the door doesn't smack her when it opens that happens so you can always offer assistance that way Listen attentively when you're talking with a person uh, who has difficulty speaking. Don't try to finish their statements. It, it's, we live in a society that's very rushed, so we're always on the move, and it's really easy. We, we finish each other's statements, but it, I think it's even more frustrating if you have a, a speech impairment and you're trying to get your thought out and somebody's constantly talking over you and finishing your idea. I know my wife gets mad at me when I do it, so. Um, when speaking with a person who uses a wheelchair or crutches, place yourself at eye level in front of the person to facilitate a conversation when possible. This is a tough one because I'm a big guy. My knees hurt if I try to like bend down if there's not a chair available. So sometimes it's you don't have to be as close to the person. You can step back so you can have an easier thing. I'm going to walk out. It's very uncomfortable for someone in a wheelchair. And, Imagine yourself sitting in a regular chair. If someone stands over you and talks to you like this, there's a, a dynamic that gets generated of power and stuff. So you can just step back. If you have to have a private conversation, because you tend to be a little louder when you're speaking like this, you might want to go somewhere. But if you just take a little bit of a step back, it's just easier on the person's neck. Do you want to handle the mixture? Yeah, but I just want to go back to the um, number seven. Just when you're talking to somebody with a disability and they, you have difficulty understanding them, because that happens often, just don't pretend like you know what they're talking about. It's just by nodding and saying, OK, and then you walk away and you're, you say to yourself, what really did I just nod to or did I say yes to? Because you'd rather really know what they want um, and if that's the case, if they have somebody that is working with them in their department or someone that they know, you know they know, you can ask them, can you help me? Can you help interpret this? Instead of just agreeing with whatever they're saying. Um, I just think that's a big one because it happens a lot where a lot of people, because you feel uncomfortable. You don't want to say, I don't really understand what you're saying. But that's actually better than saying, okay and walking away and having no idea what they're talking about. So I just wanted to. That also happens conversely, that a lot of students that we work with, especially if they have a, a mild intellectual disability, they want to be quote unquote normal. So oftentimes, they won't ask for clarification. They want to be seen as normal. So you'll tell them something, they'll go, OK. And they walk away going, ah, I don't know what she just said. Or you ask, or so when you ask somebody and you know that they have an intellectual disability, you can ask them kind of what did I just say? If they parrot it right back to you, like word for word, it's probably a good 
idea that they didn't understand what you were saying, they're just repeating what you said. But if they can kind of put it in their own words, it helps that they understood what you were saying. Um, eight, we went twice. Yeah. When trying to get attention for someone with de who's deaf, the easiest way is this. This is like the international, I'm trying to get your attention signal for, for deaf people. So you can just do, do this, or you can tap them on the shoulder. Um, I, I worked with a deaf client uh, for quite a while, and he, uh, we worked on the computer, so he would always be very deep. He was a programmer, actually, so he'd be deep in thought, and I was always worried that I was going to scare him walking up behind him. And finally, one day, he was like, that doesn't bother me. I just got over it a long time ago. So would walk up behind him and he'd be working on the computer and you can't like clear your throat, announce yourself, so I'm trying not to like do that so he can, so he jump, because I would probably jump, but he had just developed that kind of over time that he was just used to people interrupting him. Finally, relax. Don't be embarrassed if you happen to use common expressions that seem to relate to a person's disability. I just did it about 30 seconds ago because I just called him my deaf client instead of my client that, who is deaf. It happens from time to time. Um, also, like when you're talking to someone, we, there's a counselor that works for the state who is totally blind. And we were talking about the baseball game the other night. And it sometimes feels awkward to say, hey, did you see the game the other night? Because I know he's blind. And, but he still listens to sports and follows sports. So it's OK to say stuff like that. See you later, those common phrases. You don't have to be embarrassed about that. But just relax and kind of being open to the idea that you're just trying to meet the person and communicate with the person of what they need to have their needs met. So we've kind of gone through some of these already. Um, wheelchairs, they're not their equipment, or they're not equipment, they're people. Um, they're somebody's personal space. Don't offer, don't ask, can I go for a ride? Can I sit on your lap and you take me down the hall? These are all things that I've actually seen employees at companies say and do. So I see eyes kind of like, that's, nobody does that. But believe it or not, it happens quite often. Um, beware of how somebody can reach things. You heard um, Stella talk during her video that Barbecue tongs were her greatest asset because they could pick stuff up. Um, just kind of be aware of that kind of stuff. That's a lot of accommodations that need to be made for people with disabilities, especially physical disabilities, are generally desk height, just raising workspaces and stuff like that and making some accessibility. Uh, they did a study a few years ago about accommodations for a person with disability. The average accommodation for a person with disability cost the employer under $500 to, uh, to deal with. Uh, the state government will also cover anything that it would be a, considered a hardship to an employer that if it's very expensive. Uh, I, I worked with a, a gentleman at a Giant Eagle. He worked in the bakery, and he had a motorized chair that raised up and down. Um, and the accommodation that we had to ask for him was it was the bathroom that had the automatic doors on it. Because in Pennsylvania, they only have to have one bathroom that has automatic doors that is handicap accessible. So, but it was on the other side of the store. And it was probably a f 10 minutes round trip for him to get out of the bakery and get there. And when he decided he had to go, it was always an issue. So the accommodation was, can we move? Uh, can they put an automatic door in the, the bathroom in the employee? It cost them, I think, $300 to do. But accommodations, when people talk about accommodations, people get very scared. But they generally cost the employer under $500. Um, we're going to kind of go through these quicker. You want to go? Yeah, this is kind of what I touched base on before. It's basically um, when somebody has a speech impairment, just give your full attention. Um, if you have trouble understanding, don't pretend or nod your head or say OK. Um, you can ask them to write, the, to write it down. That, ha that helps often, if just so they can write it down. Um, and just be patient. Um, a lot of these people, especially at Lakeland, a lot of our interns, they really want to be independent. So when they're trying to communicate or do something or open the door, offer assistance. But I, a lot of them also want to be um, 
um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. But they want to be independent, so just be patient as much as you can. Hidden disabilities. These are uh, the toughest ones, and this is something that we we end up talking to intern or to clients in general a lot that, with hidden disabilities because some people don't want to disclose their disability. Sometimes I had a, a gentleman that I worked with. He works at Sherwin Williams now. He, if you were going to stereotype him, he is Sheldon from Big Bang Theory to a T. But he refused to let his employer, he didn't want them to know that I existed in helping him get a job. And when he had come to me, he had been on 62 interviews. And he couldn't figure out why he couldn't get a job. So we did a mock interview, and he let me attend one interview with him. And he didn't make eye contact. He didn't shake hands. He was very awkward during the interview. Um, so we worked on some of that stuff. And magically, he went to this interview, got a job at Sherwin-Williams. He was well qualified. He's an IT analyst for them but he never wanted them to know that I existed and didn't disclose to them when he first started. So we kind of would meet outside of work and have coffee every once a week in the morning and talk about how work was going and stuff. And he told me, I'm, I'm gonna let him know that I have a disability. I'm comfortable with my boss and I'm gonna tell him now. I said, that's awesome. So it happened and I called him and I said, how'd it go? And he was like, well, my boss told me he thought he, he said he knew something was up, <laughs> but he was waiting for me to tell him because he wasn't going to ever accuse me. And he said that made me feel good because he knew that there was something going on with me, but he was comfortable enough with me, and I feel better about it. So it's something that we struggle with someone, when someone has a disability because we talk to them as job placement specialists often about the benefits and the cons of disclosing your disability. And for some people, it's very hard, especially people that are higher functioning. Um, they don't want to be seen as different. And that's what this whole training is about. Um, when we talk about mental health and emotional disabilities, try to keep stress to a minimum. Life is stressful, so that's, that's a tough one. But when you, if you know that someone has a, a, dis, a mental health disability um, and they're having issues, Ask how you can help. That's probably the best thing that you can do. Um, when you're working with someone with a developmental or intellectual disability, speak clearly, um, be specific, be patient. Uh, routine works very well. Also, direct verbal explanations, allowing extra time for reading. As job coaches, we do a lot to try and help people with task lists. Um, sometimes we have clients that don't read, so we use visual cues for people to, to remind them of things to do. We had, I have, have a gentleman that works at Parma Hospital, and he has a very specific list of things, but he can never seem to remember like two parts of the kitchen he has to mop at the end of the night. So all we did was at the door where he clocks out, took a picture of where he's supposed to mop, two pictures, and laminated them and stuck them right above the time clock. So he always, when he clocks out, he's like, oh man, I forgot to mop that and he goes back and it's just a simple visual reminder of did you do this. Autism, uh, there's a lot of, there's often a, a lot of sensory things that go along with people on the, the spectrum. Um, there's often a lot of rigidity in thinking. They believe how things should be and they should be a very specific way. Um, and that's something when we work with someone with on the spectrum, we kind of, it's a two-way street. We're working with them to be more flexible and the employer to understand that they don't always see things in a, a gray world. It's, it's a black and white situation. Um, I'm just kind of, we're running out of time, so I'm trying to keep us going. Uh, and I just want to say the other thing with hidden disabilities, when we, for job developers like Andy and myself, we have, like he said, we have to talk to the employers about some of the things that you might not see right away or whatever. But we also have to talk to all the other coworkers, you know, because we'll place someone and you'll have, an, for instance, I have a girl at Panera and the other coworkers are like, I don't understand, she's not doing it this way or this way. And so we also have to let them know that this is how she learns and this is because they don't see it and they're also young kids working there so um. and this training is something that we often do when people are hired if the employer comes to us and says hey 
I just hired this person, they've disclosed to me, would you be willing to come in and talk to my staff so we can tailor it to the person's disability? Um, and that's with the person's permission, but it, it helps a lot because that understanding and kind of knowing what works for the person. We've talked about visual impairments a lot, so we're just gonna skip over that. And we've talked about hearing impairments a lot. Uh, it's the ability that counts. People with disabilities have the right to full inclusion and integration in society. People with disabilities can work and people with disabilities can benefit from the same service that to the rest of society. Um, and they deserve the opportunities to work just like everyone else. Uh, we talk about kind of, the pendulum has swung. I have two uncles that both have Down syndrome uh, that are in their 50s. And when they were born, my grandmother was told you should put them in an asylum and forget they ever existed. And my grandmother decided that that was not going to be how it was going to be. And they were going to be part of the family and they were going to live. And she's made what I consider missteps because my uncles still live with her. And she never encouraged them to go live on their own because her and my grandfather like them being at home. But both of my uncles have spent time in workshops. They've worked in the community. They've gone back to workshops in different points in their life. They've changed jobs five to seven times over their career. My one uncle is in his mid to late 50s and just came home last week and declared he's retiring. <laughs> he, uh, he said, my knees hurt and I don't wanna work anymore and I don't wanna go to the workshop and I don't wanna go to a day program, so I'm retiring. Let's have a retirement party. And my grandma said, okay, we're gonna treat him like everybody else. And that pendulum has swung so much. I mean, we're, we're really inclusive now to people having full and independent lives. Um, transportation is something here in Lake County that's always an extra special uh, struggle uh, for someone with a disability. Lake Tran only runs till 7 p.m. Monday through Friday, and I don't believe they have Saturday services until the holidays. So for employment, especially for entry-level positions, it makes it very tough for a person with a disability. So we often, often have to negotiate accommodations for that. Um, more and more people as educators are, are going to college with disabilities. Um, and people just don't want the pity or empathy. They just want to be treated like everyone else. So what can you do? Challenge the der ugh, derogatory language and jokes. Take responsibility for making all people feel welcome and get to know people with disabilities. And we're right at our time. So does anybody have any questions? This was good. Lady in the back. What kind of accommodations are there with people with mental illness? Accommodations, so accommodations always have to be reasonable. Um, Sometimes uh, accommodations could be a reduced uh, workload, so taking a full-time job to a part-time job. Um, sometimes it could be a delayed start time. Uh, there is actually, we just went through a case with a young man that there is no federal guideline that where an employer is required to do a delayed start time or an indefinite start time. Um, a lot of accommodations we often find are around if you need to go to a counseling appointment or, or see a doctor. So you can get off to go receive treatment that you need to um, or having indefinite leave, especially when we deal with individuals with uh, schizoaffective disorders and stuff, if they're cycling or through bipolarity, if they need some time off. Um, sometimes that works through uh, FMLA and stuff like that. But those are kind of the accommodations. Any other questions? Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The Knowledge Exchange is a presentation of Lakeland Community College.